Uh, dear brothers and sisters, it's just such a joy to be here with you today. I want you to please join me as we're going to be in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And as you arrive to, your, to our text today, I want to uh, bring some greetings to get started. First of all, I want to say that La Fuente Church in Quito, Ecuador is uh, really grateful for you. Uh, we keep you guys in our minds and prayers constantly, and they send their love. Uh, secondly, on behalf of my family, Marissa and Willow and Knox, they would love to be here. Uh, I want to say that we're extremely grateful for you. Um, I'm going to try not to get too emotional, uh, but a lot of the stuff that we're going to be talking about today, about the Great Commission, are things that I learned in seminary and I learned through, through, through the, like just the word, but like getting to see it lived out, it happened in the midst of this congregation for me personally. One of the things that ended up happening is that as the Lord sent me to Ecuador, one of the models that I had was being part of this church many years ago. So I just want to say that I'm really grateful to be able to open this passage with you. Uh, but we're just really excited and grateful, Marissa and I and the, and the kids, to be able to partner with you guys for the sake of Christ as we serve in Ecuador. Um, and it's a blessing to be here, and it's special in many different ways, uh, but one of them is that last Sunday you guys celebrated 25 faithful years of ministry, and last Sunday, July 10th, Marissa and I celebrated 12 years of marriage. <laughs> and as I think of that important day, I just, I just see like the connection of, of thinking of that day in a way in which Marissa and I usually, what we try to do is our tradition is to celebrate our anniversary. And part of that includes to have a moment in which we chat, in which we, we try to examine how are we doing. We, we, we ask ourselves questions and just we try to not take things for granted. It's just really easy, friends, to kind of go into marriage and just put marriage in autopilot and just take things for granted, Right. Uh, and we know that, and that's why eventually people try to renew their vows or just refresh things, because it's easy to just get through the rhythms. And friends, I think that something that happens many times for us is just that we get to the rhythms of what does it mean to be a Christian, and we don't think about this important passage. Today, as we open our Bibles, this passage that we probably all have heard about is a passage that can easily be taken for granted or that it can be neglected. And this passage that we all know is the Great Commission. Now, uh, as I share this, what I want to share it in a, in a way in which I can uh, obviously expand the text, and we're going to look at the text, but I want us also to just be reminded of this important passage, personally for my heart, because as I said, some of the principles that we're going to see today here are things that I want to be reminded, as Marissa and I have been in Ecuador now for 12 years, and I want to be reminded, but also so that you guys can also know what is happening in Ecuador, and like so, to give you a little bit of insights of what happens there. So, so one of the things that I wanted to start as a way of introduction is to, to, to think of what happened once I left Whole Bible Church. In the year 2005-ish, uh, I, I got pretty much kicked out from Pastor Leek's house, and I ended up at Master's University, um, and then... <laughs> you guys, some of you guys know exactly what I mean. Um, and what ended up happening when I got to Masters is that Pastor Leek and some of the saints here had introduced me, and they will ask me, like, so where are you from? You're from Ecuador, right? And, and Ecuador, isn't that the place where Steve Saint and, and Jim Elliott's story? And I honestly looked at him like, who are you talking about? I have no idea what you're talking about. And once I got to Masters, I ended up learning of the incredible work that the Lord had done in my country, in my backyard that I didn't know about. And one of the things that ended up happening is that that gripped my heart, and I got to see the, the beauty of redemption, the things that we got to sing about, got to see them in a really practical way, and it just became something in which was like, Lord, like, where do you want me to go? And one thing that happened, and one of my professors used to call it, is that then eventually, like, you're from Ecuador and you're interested in missions, became something in which people ended up around campus with a lot of, some of the friends that I used to hang out with, it was like, those are the people that are into missions, and it almost becomes this badge, and you can see it not only in college campuses and Christian organizations, even in local churches, in which there's those people that are known like as the missions people. The people that end up in the missions committee. But what ends up happening, friends, is that we can easily think that that's just a special type of Christian that is called to missions, which is not true. About 10 years ago, a known blogger and pastor that has been a great blessing in my life was reviewing the T4G conference, and, and, and he wrote these lines that, that really surprised me. And he said about a missions a sermon during the conference, that he said, that was the evening we had dinner with such and such and so on, and I didn't know the name of the speaker from Adam, and the topic was missions, which frankly suggested to me that it was missable. 
Then he says, and then absolutely everyone who was there said he blew the roof off, figures, so it's my, in my listen list when I get back home, but I haven't done that yet. Dear friends, I believe that many times when we see and we think about the Great Commission, uh, many times we think about that as something that, that we help those people outside, that th th those committees do it, those people that are called for missions, dear friends, and, and it's something eventually that could be missable. But, but dear friends, I want us to think that our identity as believers, our identity as followers of Christ makes us by identity, by the, or, or DNA, missionaries. It's not something separate that, that we can like separate, but, but it's part of who we are. I want to put my cards on the table. And as Spurgeon said, every Christian is a missionary or is an imposter. We're all to be missionaries. Therefore, this passage is not just for missionaries, for the missions committee, but uh, for those super special Christians that are called for missions but it's for all of us as followers of Christ. And my desire today, as I said, is to review this familiar text uh, in a more devotional way and encourage our hearts to be reminded that this Great Commission is for all believers. And as I do that, I want to also just share some insights that might help you know how to pray for us in Ecuador, how to pray for the region of Latin America, okay? So please, with this introduction, please, let's read the text and let's pray together. Matthew 28, Mateo 28, we're going to be in verses 18 to 20. I read from the ESV and says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray together, please. Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Lord God, because we have the opportunity to, to, to worship, to open the word, Lord, to sing, um, to have the door open, Father God. In many places in the world, they can do that. Lord, even a few weeks ago, there were unrest in my own country, Lord God, and we, we, we had to, to do different things, Lord God. So, so this is an incredible privilege, Lord God, so let us not take it for granted. And Father God, I pray that, that Jesus will be seen as huge, uh, while, while, while Juan Moncayo will get out of the picture completely, Lord God. So people will be excited, um, not even about missions, but about Christ, Father God, when we're done today. For your honor and your glory, in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Okay, so number one, the first thing that we need to think about is that the context doesn't allow us to have pretexts on the Great Commission. Please, as we go into this text, I want you to think of what had just happened. If you guys please just follow me real briefly. Chapter 27, um, you start to see various things as, uh, you know, the, the disciples are with Jesus. Uh, you see that there's the upper, um, I'm thinking in Spanish, which is kind of interesting right now, uh, the Lord's Supper instituted. And then you see the arrest of Jesus, the trial of Jesus, the death of Jesus. Then you see his resurrection. Then you see that he spends time with the disciples. And now you see these words. And, and I share this with you because I want you to think of two important characteristics of these words. The disciples just saw the murder of the rabbi. They, they saw Christ fall victim to the various authorities, die in a bloody cross. They are confused. And I want you to think of two things. The first thing is I want you to think of the type of words that Jesus, that Jesus uses. First, we can think of Jesus through the uh, Gospels, in which sometimes he uses parables, earthly stories with heavenly meanings. Sometimes he asks the disciples questions. You know, who do you say that I am? Why are you afraid? Matthew 8. Why did you doubt? Matthew 14. Do you still not see or understand? Mark 8. This time, friends, no more parables. As Jesus speaks, there's no more questions. This is a strong, clear statement that is filled with clarity and depth. This is important. We're going to come back to that. Secondly, I want you to think that these are the last words. And the last words hold weight. Dear friends, as, as missionaries, my wife and I have learned this the hard way. One of the things of being in Ecuador for 12 years is that we've seen missionaries come and go. And many times we build relationships with them. And then they leave. And, and those goodbyes are really hard. As we're hearing in, in the United States from Ecuador, one of the things that for me is really hard is that eventually, like, we come here, we spend time with my, with my in-laws, we spend time with my, my, with, with my mom and my dad, with family members, and eventually I know that my kids are going to have to say goodbye to grandma and grandpa. And that's hard. And one of the things that I've noticed is that every time that happens, my mom, my dad, my in-laws choose really carefully what they say to us. Marissa and I got married, as I said, July 10th. And a few days later, four days later, we got on an airplane and went to Ecuador. 
And I remember my father-in-law, as I was taking his, his, his only daughter to Ecuador, he looked at me in the eye and said, like, I love you. Take care of my daughter. And those words just stuck to me. Those last words have weight. We choose carefully what are the last words someone says. And Jesus chooses his words, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That Greek word that is translated authority means rightful, actual, an intended power to act or to possess, control, use, or dispose of something or somebody. Dear friends, the, the point is so clear. He sees the disciples in the eyes of Jesus, that those eyes that still remember seeing the rabbi crucified, going through excruciating pain, those eyes that can see the marks on his hands and his feet. And Jesus says, like, like a general giving orders, I have power, I have jurisdiction, I have authority to rule over heaven and earth. And if you don't believe me, I just proved it. I just defeated death. John 3.35, the father loves his son and he has given all things to his hand. And these are his last words. Those are the marching orders of the church. Jesus here is not stuttering. He's not asking questions. He's not giving parables. He's making this as clear as possible. And he says, go and make disciples. And once again, this is not just for missionaries. This is for all of us. Ten years ago, like I said, I stood in a church like this one. I, I don't know if you knew, but like Pastor Kirby, that was a, a, an elder here, married my wife and I. <laughs> and I got up from the steps, and we were standing in front of each other. We gave our vows. And in those vows, I committed to love my wife, to protect my wife, to be faithful to my wife. And those are the kind of words that I used. Now I want you to imagine if you show up to a wedding and, 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 and the groom and the bride are there and you hear this kind of words. Well, you know what? Instead of saying I committed, say like, you know what? I pray. I'm praying about being faithful to you. I'm going to consider it. I'm doing a Bible study to understand the implications of this call to be faithful to you, to love you, to cherish you, to protect you. Dear friends, that, that would not be too good. <laughs> no, friends, and, and we laugh about that, but many times we treat the Great Commission in that way. God has clearly said that we are to make disciples, but we're kind of thinking about it, praying about it, making Bible studies about it, and that's great. We need to do those things. We need to be informed, and we're going to talk about that eventually. But, but these, are, these are orders. There are no suggestions. No, friends, this needs to be something that is in our minds. One of my, one of my professors used to say that Jesus' last words must be the first words that are in our mind all the time. We're constantly thinking about it. That, that, that's what, what motivates what we're going to do. The church that we read in the book of Acts is a church that is driven by this understanding. Dear friends, and how does that look for you? For me, I, I would say that, it, that it's kind of a little easy because, like, even the introduction, he's a pastor in Ecuador. So it's almost like, okay, so you do disciples in Quito, Ecuador. But, but, dear friends, this is for all of us, right? So this means that how does this look like in your marriage? Some of you are married to an unbeliever. That's your missions field. Some of you guys have children. As I was getting a tour of the building, the building looks great, but, but there's a, a wing somewhere, I think, I don't even know where it is, but, but somewhere in this building, there's a wing in which you have an incredible missions field in those classrooms. And praise the Lord for, for faithful servants that are serving there. You might have grandchildren. That might be your missions field, your community, your schools, the jobs that you have. So many places, friends. You are a missionary in those places. In the same way that, by God's grace, the missionaries that you support, and, and praise the Lord for a church that wants to support the work of Christ around the world, and they're seeking to be faithful, and you have been careful in selecting those people. In the same way, we're all called to be faithful wherever we are, friends. How are you doing with that today? Where is God calling you? You're already in the missions field. Are you aware of that? Here, there's um, something else that, as we move to our second point, is that when we talk about authority, we're, we know that Christ rules through his word. We're singing the word, we're reading the word, we're praying the word, we're preaching the word, we're explaining the word. Sometimes we get to see the word. And one of the things that I can share with you is that many times in missions, this approach of like the centrality of the word has been lost sometimes in missions. And you need to be mindful of that as you do missions. 
in Ecuador, um, there, used to, there is a radio station, like the Lord has used it in incredible ways. But one time I had a meeting with a representative of that radio station, and this uh, person wanted to talk to me, and we ended up just chatting through different things. And one of the things that, that really impacted me was that they were sharing a little bit of their new philosophy of, of what they want to do with the radio station. And, and pretty much the philosophy was like, let's try to not have as much teaching through the airwaves and more like singing and more like positive things, things that will encourage you, things like that, and not the preaching of the word. So programs that I remember one taxi driver that one time was just like, I, I, it was just sharing with me. There was a connection there, and I was listening to a, to a, pa, to a sermon by Pastor MacArthur, and, and, I, and, and the Lord was using that as he just moved. And, 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 and the word, he started to hear that, and, and the word was convicting him. But, but, but they think that that's not important anymore. The important thing is that you just kind of like tune your radio, and you just find a song that sounds cool, that sounds like any other song that has quality. But at the end of the day, like, it just, it just encourages you to, to just be positive. Dear friends, that, that doesn't change life. Many times people are thinking that there's authorities in other things. Other sources that have the authority to help and heal and save, and that's not true. In some cases, it might be money. It might be the personality of the DJ. It's financial security. It's personalities. It's looks. It's, it's, it's in, in, in my context, too, you can see religious syncretistic mix. In other cases, it's the cult. And uh, there's people that pay thousands of dollars to go to the jungles of Ecuador so they get hit by leaves of shamans because that's going to change them. And there's all sorts of idolatry, friends. So what is the authority as you do this great commission, is, is the word of God. And this brings us to a logical progression from this point. It's like, as we do missions, we do missions, as John Piper said, missions exist because worship doesn't. It's about worship. People are worshiping something. People have authority to say, this is what it's, it's worthy for me. This, this is what has value for me. So number two, we have a worship argument. In many places, the church will sing about God, and we think that that's worship, and that's part of worship, Absolutely. And I can think of many times in which people go on short-term mission trips to Ecuador or whenever we've helped in other places, and, and people love the cultural expressions of worship, of music in that culture. It, there'll be African rhythms or chantings from Europe or indigenous sounds from the Andes. But people like those things. But remember something is that worship is not something external. Before, we're worshiping with our mouths, with our piano, with every instrument. First, we're worshiping with our hearts. As we think of the world of missions around the world, we need to make sure that we help people understand that the worship starts at the heart. People may sing passionately about God of heaven and on earth without considering that their worship is an action that has been happening the whole week. That's been happening as you drive, as you engage with your spouse, as, as, as you discipline your children, as you watch a, sports, a sporting event. All those things happen. And the only one that can change hearts is, is the Lord Jesus Christ. When I was at Masters, I got offered the opportunity to go as a translator for a music tour of an important Christian band in Latin America. And at one point, we got to Sao Paulo, Brazil. And it was this huge stadium. It was a ginormous um, uh, event. And uh, at some point during the worship, um, there was this chant that, 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 that the crowd started to do, and it was something like, da, da, ha, da, da. And eventually, you had like hundreds, if not thousands of people doing this move. And I remember then just chatting with a, with a youth leader that was there with, with this huge youth group, and this youth leader said, like, hey, don't get too excited in his own words. And he said, you know what, like, reality is that last time we had an event like this one, this one was kind of just like the getting started and the emotions, and then we need to be dealing with immorality and all of other stuff. So just the singing was just kind of encouraging another type that was not honoring God in their hearts. It was just providing an opportunity for the flesh. The point was that biblical understanding of the heart helps us realize that as we do missions, we're changing that heart. We're, by the word, the word is changing. The, where the heart is worshiping, friends. Another thing as I think of worship is just thinking a bit about the context of different places. 
as you guys are an ACB training center as well, uh, one of the things that we do in, as we train people in biblical counseling is that we help people see um, how counseling, you know, the minister of the word, is not something new. You know, how many of you guys know who Jay Adams is? Some of you guys know who Jay Adams is, right? And some people will say that Jay Adams, you know, is the birth or, of biblical counseling. We'll say, no, 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 definitely not. Biblical counseling started all the way in Genesis, correct? With serpent. And, you know, he, she's given bad, he's given bad counsel. And then you see, and many times in biblical counseling centers, what we will try to show people is that there's counseling throughout the history of the church. And you see that, you know, in the whole Bible. Then you see uh, in, in the Apostolic Fathers. Then you can trace it all the way, Reformation. Then you have the Puritans, etc. But one of the things that really, really surprised me was realizing that one of the times that I was teaching this in Ecuador, I realized that there was something that was missing. And it was the fact that my country, my region, was not part of the timeline. Let me explain this in this way. At the time that Luther hammered his thesis in 1517 to the point of the Diet of Worms that gives the spark of the Protestant Reformation that will literally change the world, my region was only switching from the worship of the moon and the sun to the worship of the images of the Virgin Mary and a lot of saints. Actually, around the same time, of some key events of the Reformation was at around the same time the, that started the construction of the first Catholic Church in the Dominican Republic, Santa Iglesia Catedral Basilica Nuestra Señora de la Encarnación. They were around the same time. Dear friends, the, the Protestant Reformation missed Latin America completely. If we keep going, while Owen, Edwards, and others were writing about the mortification of sin, overcoming sin and temptation, the spiritual affections, Latin America was deep in darkness of rituals, idolatry, and syncretism that still are there today. Let's keep moving forward. Let's go to 1892, the decade around when the Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, finished his faithful race after a fruitful ministry. He went to be with the Lord. Around the same time, it's likely that the first shipment of Bibles arrived to the port of Guayaquil in Quito, in Ecuador. Needless to say, those Bibles were there illegally. It was illegal to read a Bible in your own language. It's actually cited that a custom agent said, as long as Mount Chimborazo, and let's pause there for a second, Mount Chimborazo is the highest mountain in Ecuador at, up, at over 20,000 feet. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful mountain. If you get close to it, like I remember just taking the turn and, and, and you know, on the road, you take the turn and it's there and, it's, and, and everybody that has seen it is like, wow. It, it just takes your breath. It's, it's beautiful. And this guy said, as long as Mount Chimborazo stands, these books will never enter Ecuador. Dear friends, God is good and he's powerful and he created those mountains. Those Bibles enter the country to give testimony of what Revelation 5, 9 to 10 says, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. It's a blessing to, to think about those things and the faithfulness of God. In the next 100 years, Ecuador became a hub for missions. It was in Ecuador and in, in a river, in the Curaray River, that Nate Saint, Jim Elliot, and three other missionaries gave their lives so that tribe could hear the beautiful gospel of Christ, friends. You might not know this, but when Marissa and I got married, we actually rented an apartment in the Roger Yodarian Memorial Home. Roger Yodarian um, uh, was killed in the Curaray River. Uh, his wife, Barbara, uh, raised funds, and they built this building, and, and we ended up just renting an apartment there before it got taken, uh, torn down, uh, and that's where La Fuente Church started which is such a blessing and a privilege. And what a reminder of God's faithfulness. And I share all this, friends, because there's this long line of faithfulness, of reminding that the only one that is worth worshiping is Jesus Christ. And we're all called to that. We're all called to do that. So, what is that we need to do? So, so that we understand that worship is about, uh, if missions is about worship, and also, we understand that this is not a suggestion, but a commandment for all of us. What is that we need to know, or what is that we need to do? And let's continue, please, with the text. The text says, go, therefore, and 
make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always till the end of the age. Once again, I want you guys to notice two things as we read, as we go over this text. Please notice that the main verb is not go, but the main verb is make disciples. Please notice that the text does not say go, therefore, and make people raise their hand. The work of a missionary is not to just like dress as a clown and pass candy and then do a magic trick to eventually kind of like do a mini presentation that is not really even the gospel. The text doesn't say that go and make decisions, get people to raise their hands, make them walk an aisle, make them go to an event. Even sometimes be forced to like now get baptized in this water right now without understanding what you're doing. It says make disciples. What is a disciple? Someone that follows Christ constantly. Now it models their life after their, their, their savior, after their teacher. That's what we're doing here, right? Sitting under the teaching of the Lord. Hearing what he's teaching us through his word. The objective, friends, of, of missions is that people will look more like Christ. It's not just to, to, to have numbers. And dear friends, I can tell you as a missionary, it's, it's really easy to want to have numbers. Because as a missionary, you want to present something that people can be like, look, we're supporting something that is giving results. And dear friends, now I'm a U.S. citizen as well, and I see this, this, this idea in which we like numbers. We like, we like to see that what we're investing is giving some results, but, but we don't know the results that the world is doing. What we need to be looking is at faithfulness. One thing that happened, uh, once again, when we returned to Ecuador is that I got invited one time, and this is to illustrate the point, I got invited to go and translate for a, for a short-term mission trip that was doing uh, some evangelistic camps, sports camps, in the jungle of Ecuador. So we went, and every night they'll do their presentation, and I will translate, and at the end of the night we'll have a little huddle time, and then everybody was like, hey, in your group, how many people raised their hands? Okay, five, and you, 10, and you, 20, well, and you, 30, and then eventually we'll count, and by the end of the week we had like hundreds of people that had professed Christ, in quotes. But the last day before the trip was done, something happened logistically that, that, that helped me see the reality of sometimes what's happening. As we finish the setup for the day, the bus came in and they had to switch the bus for some technical issue and they brought a smaller bus. And we tried to pack everybody in there, but at the end of the day, like, I had to stay. And the bus was going to come back and pick me up a few hours later. So as I stayed, I went and I talked to some of the nationals because I was really excited. What is God doing here? This is, this is so great. So, so I went and talked to some of the, of the locals and Spanish, and I was telling them, like, hey, hermanos, how can, I, how can we serve you? After all this that is happening here, what is the next thing that we can do to, to encourage you in your walk with Christ, to, to help you mature as a disciple? And this person was incredibly uncomfortable. They looked at me like, what are you doing here? You're supposed to, like, live with everybody else. And then he proceeded to help me understand that in reality, because this is kind of the road to get where Jim Elliott and Nate Said and all of them um, uh, were used by God. This is kind of like almost like a tourism missions kind of perspective in which people always stop here. They do a gospel presentation. They know that they need to raise their hands and like show some interest. And then the next team comes up and does the same thing and they raise their hand again. And they even told me that even they understand that there's some teams that we need to be a little more animated and there's other teams that we need to be a little more, more, more calm. And then he connected this to help me understand that at the end of the day, they sell like little jewelry, like made out of Tawa and things like that. And it's like, you know what, we, we really need them to keep coming because then we, we, we sell our stuff and that's what keeps our village going. Those are kind of the things that we need to be thinking about as we do missions. One time I heard that if you count the professions of Christ made in islands like in Haiti and in places like that, you have more professions of faith than actual people that live in those areas. The result, friends, it's, it's really sad. Because as I work there, as many faithful people seek to work in those areas, then you try to share the gospel with that person, and they've been inoculated from the true gospel. Now they're like, I already did that. I already raised my hand, and even like I did it with that cool group that came in. And there's nothing wrong. There's a place for short-term mission trips, but we need to remember that it's not about raising hands. It's about seeing the Lord work through the power of his word, and we can't control that. We trust the Lord in that. 
Love it or call is to make disciples, followers of Christ, people that want to sit and hear the teacher speak, but also more mold their lives to the teaching to be more like Christ. And this is hard. This, this, this takes effort. It's hard work. And that's why it's being, I think, commissioned to local churches. And that's why local churches are so important in God's plan. I want you guys to notice one more thing, please. Please go back to the text. So how do you make these disciples? And please observe in your Bibles. It says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. We talked a little about that. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And notice this part. It says, Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. This is the reason we got involved in biblical counseling. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. One of my teachers used to say, notice that the Great Commission does not say teaching them all that I have commanded you. Does it say that? Teaching them all that I have commanded you. That's just about information. No. It says, but teaching them to observe, to live. Friends, that is true discipleship. It's when information turns into transformation, when we bring the gospel to bear in the lives of people, even in the midst of some of the hardest moments in their lives. That's what this church did to me many years ago. I knew it up here. But then when I saw it lived out, it's like, okay, so how does the gospel apply to this situation? I realized, like, wow, I, that is growth. That's what discipleship should be about. I don't know for you guys, but for us in Ecuador, the pandemic was, was extremely hard. But at the same time, it was a blessing. As we were in the middle of the pandemic, many marriages that were kind of shaky, as they were stuck in, and we had really hard um, 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 lock-ins. Lock-ins is the word in English? Yeah, lock-ins. We had really strong lock-ins. So, so people were stuck now at home in a marriage that was already struggling. So that just exploded things. And that was an opportunity to say, like, okay, so I know what the Bible says about my marriage, but now can I observe what the Bible says about my marriage? C can I live out what it says? Mission sometimes has focused so much on the reaching that we have neglected the teaching and this important part that, that, complete, that, that makes the, whole, the Great Commission something that is not just something about information, friends. In some places in the world, we are really all about like, getting them to hear the gospel, absolutely, but we're not focusing on how does the gospel transform lives. So, so when people end up saying, like, dear brother, dear mention, like, the work of biblical counseling, when I think of biblical counseling, I'm just thinking of discipleship. Ecuador was, again, after Jim Elliot and all that great wave of missions that came in. There's many people that understand the gospel, but they don't know how the gospel applies to day-to-day -day circumstances. Let me give you an example. A few years ago, uh, we started to work in this major translation project of 27, or I think it's 27 to 30 hours of biblical counseling instruction. That, that's what ACBC will call like the fundamentals track. Okay? So we started to translate the fundamentals track, and, and by God's grace, the Lord had provided in our church a dear sister who was theologically trained, and it's an incredible translator. And she started to translate this work, and, and she was doing a great job. Eventually, she started to fall behind. And she kept falling more behind and more behind. So eventually, I give her a call and say, like, dear sister, so what, what is happening? We need to kind of keep translating this stuff, what's happening? And this dear sister told me one word that, that I will never forget. And she said, it's so hard to translate. As I try to translate, the Lord brings conviction on my heart, and I have to stop. I cry. I have to make a call. I have to pray. I have never translated something like this. And what I'm trying to say here is that many times that's the experience that I have seen in Latin America. There's many people that understand that they've been translated. We're a language that we're extremely uh, blessed because there's a lot of works that are translated into Spanish way before in other languages. So we have a lot of content. But content is not the same thing as transforming. And that's something really important for us to think as we think of missions. And that's the role of biblical counseling in the life of a church. I want you guys to turn with me to Romans chapter 15, please. So how does it look like to see a mature disciple? Once again, I'm so grateful for dear mentors that have taught me. Romans 15, verse 14. 
The text says, and concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves, here's the profile of a mature disciple, are full of goodness, that is character. Number two, fill with all knowledge, that's content, and be able also to admonish one another. That's um, capability. And finally, to admonish one another, that is community. So this is really interesting to think about because many times we think that mission should be all about just providing a lot of content, and that's really important because the content is what transforms lives. But you realize that it doesn't just stop in the content. It needs to move into, into the hands. It needs to move into the heart. It needs to be alive that, that is seen in this way, and th this is absolutely important. When I left uh, Whole Bible to go to Masters and then for Masters, uh, my desire was, as I heard of, of missions and the need of missions, of places in the world that didn't even have a, a translation of the, of the Bible, I said, like, hey, you know what, like, I need to go to the 1040 window. And we had a group of friends there at the school that we were thinking, like, let's go to the 1040 window. And that was our goal, and we were praying about it. And someone suggested to me, he's like, Juan, you're, you're Hispanic, you're Ecuadorian, and it would be a lot easier for you not to travel straight from the U.S. to the 1040 window, but go home first and then leave from Ecuador, kind of like, like, like this was just, just, just the plan, and then leave from Ecuador to the 1040 window because then the, you, you wouldn't see, like, you will go a lot more under the radar. That's what you try to do in places like this. And that was my plan, and I was really excited about that. But when I got to Ecuador, I realized that some of the things that this passage shows were not seen in this place that has been reached through missionary work for so many years. I remember so clearly going from church to church, and there's faithful work going on there that just needs to be more informed in which my heart broke as I saw that some of the experiences that I had had here and the growth that I had had here at Hope Bible and other churches here in the United States was completely foreign. The idea of expository preaching was like, what is that? The idea of expository counseling, what is that? The centrality of the gospel, no. And I remember talking with a pastor, and this pastor was saying in two ways, and I asked him, how do you think the Ecuadorian church is doing? And they said, well, you know what, our churches, no one dances, no one drinks for many generations. And I said, like, okay, like, although that's morale, that's not the gospel. And then you have the, the reaction, that's something that you see here too, and which is like, well, you know what, we're covered by the, by the gospel, so, so everything goes. And one of these places that their missions has been there for so many years, there was a, this lack in understanding, and, and the Lord uses that and talks with, with, with pastors of this church and other churches to say, like, hey, like, why don't you stay in your country? You don't need to go and like, learn another language and another culture. You already understand Spanish. You already understand the culture. Why don't you stay there? And I honestly I didn't want to. <laughs> I wanted to go to a different place. But the Lord is faithful, and thank you so much, Whole Bible Church, for being an encouragement in those important days. Actually, Marissa and I were not planning on being missionaries. Marissa and I just wanted to go and be faithful members at a local church in Ecuador, and we couldn't find one, even though there's tons of churches. And through that... We ended up starting to help a Bible study that eventually started to, to think of like, hey, like, let's, let's work into a church. And then that church called me to ministry. And it was really neat that actually was backwards. It wasn't like we were trying to raise funds so then we can go. But we were already there. And it was like, hey, like, would you want to come and, and, and help us in <laughs> what was happening? At 28 years old, I got shingles really bad. And I remember talking with Pastor Leek and other pastors. And they were saying like, hey, like, you're overdoing this. And for some of you guys that know me are like, right? Um, <laughs> um, and it was just such a blessing to see hope and other churches come around and say, like, you know what? Like, we want to support you as missionaries. We want to come alongside what the Lord is doing. Thank you, friends. For the sake of Christ, not, not for the Munkayos. But it's just such a blessing to serve together. Now, finally, as, as we look at this uh, in Romans 15, 14, we're going to go back. It says, I'm concerning you, once again, my brethren, I myself, I'm convinced that you yourself are full of goodness, once again, character, filled with knowledge, content, and able, it has the idea of ability, also to admonish, what does it say, one another? The one another's are statements in the Bible in which you see the relationships between church members. I will say like between Christians, but I think the main representation to see that is within a church community. You can't confess yourself to one another to the universal church. You'll have to do it in the context of a local church. So I think that there's an ecclesiological argument 
And I think this is also seen, as we go back, please, to Matthew 28, and we can say a lot more about this. But the, the text says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Baptism is a way to publicly identify with the work of Christ and his body, the church. And the church can, can affirm that confession. With this in mind, I, I want to underline that when I say discipleship, when I say missions, the Great Commission must be careful not to neglect the work of local churches. We're there to, to help local churches, to support local churches. The local church must fight to regain the rightful place as the main means by which God accomplishes his plan. It's the local church, friends. And again, I'm trying to be a little bit more like testimonial of some things, but when I was at this church, I was really involved in music ministry. And I was traveling all over. And Pastor Leek and the elders here said, hey, yeah, you need to become a member. A member? I am free. Why do I need membership? <laughs> I'm just doing all this great work. And I don't know if that's in somewhere like written down, but I might have been the person that took the longest to finish that membership class. <laughs> But I started one year, and then I stopped because I taught, uh, he decided to teach this doctrine of election. And I was like, uh, uh, I don't know about that. And then they talked about, like, the importance of the one another. And they talked about, and I took me many years until the point in which I remember coming up to the front in uh, Fulton uh, School, and, and I got my, my, my little certificate of being a member. And you know what is the reason behind like, that taking so long that I think is like, what permeates many times what missions is, is that parachurch work and individual work, it's, it, it's fast. And we like results, like I said before. It's a lot easier for the missionary to just go and say, like, okay, this is what we're doing, local church, and you drag the local church to do it. But it's a lot harder, but, but it's what lasts is when the local church, the body of Christ, is seeing that vision, and the missionaries and the parachurch organization, that's what they're called parachurch, para, for, for the church, to support the local church in their work. The local church many times can be slow, and sometimes it takes a lot longer time. And we need to be patient. But that's what Christ did. I love parachurch organization. We work with many in Ecuador. But in the field, it's common for the local church to play second fiddle to the, to, to the parachurch or even to the missionary. So we need to recognize that, that this is an area in which missions needs to be careful. Like, let's support local churches, local, local assemblies. I'm running out of time. Finally, I want to talk about the presence of God. Please look at the text. It says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Great Commission ends with a comforting and encouraging reminder of where our eyes need to be of God's presence as we move forward with this calling. Friends, I wish I could tell you that in this 12 years in ministry, there's, there's a lot of happy moments, there's more joyful moments, there's, there's great testimonies that, that are usually the ones that end up in videos and end up in, in, in prayer letters, but there's a lot of really hard times. Ministry's hard. I can tell you of many times in which I had to console my wife, or my wife had to console me because we poured time and energy and, 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 and did a lot of those things to people to leave the church saying that we didn't love them. During the pandemic, there, there were times in which there, there's people that, that you love on, and then you take calls really late at night, and you go and visit their houses, and at the end of the day, they leave, and they don't leave, like, nicely. I remember the testimony of one of my professors who had the privilege to take the gospel to a tribe in Papua New Guinea. And he was sharing of a time in which, in this uh, village, in the middle of nowhere, the only way to get to a hospital was that you had to call in uh, an, an, an airplane, I believe, and then you get on that airplane, and then you have to fly out, out to, to get to a hospital in order to receive proper medical care. And his son was extremely sick. And he, tells, he told us in class how he had called and he had his son in his arms who was like burning up with fever. 
and he's just waiting for the plane to arrive. And you can just, as a parent, I just, I just can't even imagine how that would feel. And you're just waiting and waiting and waiting. And as he was waiting, he tells you that the locals starting to laugh. And the reason they were laughing, it was because in that village, many, many, many people would lose kids, and, and it was just kind of normal. And they were laughing, saying, like, oh, it finally got to you. And he shares that, that in his heart, all he wanted to do was to, to be careful with his son and go and grab him by the neck. If you do missions, if you do discipleship, just to see the results in the life of people, which is a blessing and it's beautiful. We want to see Christ form and, and for this end we toil, Colossians 1.28, you know, and, and, and it's hard and, and, and it's difficult and it's beautiful. But at the end of the day, your eyes are on the people but are most importantly in God. That is what encourages us to make disciples. Throughout the Bible, in difficult moments, God comforts his people, reminding them of his presence. Here in the text it says, And behold, I am with you. In Genesis 26, 24, And the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham your father. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your offspring for my servant Abraham's sake. Deuteronomy 2, 7, For the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands. He knows you going through uh, this great wilderness. These 40 years the Lord your God has been with you. You have lacked nothing. Deuteronomy 31, 6. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. Joshua 1, 5. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. What does Psalm 23 say? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. In ministry, you are walking through the valley of death and you want to ask God, Lord, can we run through the valley? No walking. Can we go over the valley? Can we go around? And it says walk through. And what is what sustains you in those moments, friends? The Lord and his presence. Some of the most beautiful times in ministry and as a Christian minister is those moments in which all you have is holding on to the Lord. Isn't it true that the most difficult moments many times is when we experience in a new way the presence of God, his provision? Dear friends, I don't know where you're at right now in ministry. Again, like sometimes we're like, okay, this is exciting. I'm going to go missions. The guy from Ecuador kind of like encouraged us to go and do that. Let's do it. And then someone doesn't really respond the way you want it. You go and, like, and you finally have the courage to go and talk to, to your nephew or to your grandchild that, 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 that needs the gospel. And you go and talk to them and they don't do what you thought they were going to do. And it hurts. You're trying to, to encourage someone that you see him going the path that leads to death. And you try to, to, as a minister, go on and talk to them and encourage them and exhort them. And you see that, that, that they do it anyways. And that hurts. And at that moment, you hold on to the Lord. James Montgomery Voice and his commentary of Psalm 23 says that we are never more conscious of the presence of God as when we go through the valleys of life. And notice that in the, in the darkness of the valley, on the day of trouble, God doesn't promise to take away the circumstances. He's going to work through them. As I mentioned to you, one of the, one of the hardest times in ministry and the most beautiful times were like when I remember sitting with either my wife or like some of the other elders of the church. And have you guys heard the song that him, Jesus, I, my cross have taken? Let the world despise and leave me. They have left my Savior too. Human hearts and looks deceive me. They are not like them untrue. And I remember just sitting with them, with, with my wife in my arms, and we hugging each other, just crying and realizing, like, wow, like, this is hard. But at the end of that, there was great blessing and seeing how the Lord is faithful and that we get to share in his sufferings, friends. So dear whole Bible church, as you celebrate 25 years, as Marissa and I celebrate 12 years of marriage, as you celebrate anything you want to celebrate today, remember that God has called us to make disciples of the nations. It might not be in Quito, Ecuador, although you guys are part of the work in Quito, Ecuador, and I encourage you to please pray for us, keep us in your mind. Thank you so much for dear people from the missions committee that emails us and asks us for prayer requests. Thank you so much. We need you. But at the same time, let's be faithful as the Lord has set us in your home, with your grandkids, with your church community, here in Columbia, Maryland, or wherever is your home, for his honor and his glory. Amen, friends? Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time together. Thank you for your word. Um, thank you for this dear church, Father, that has been such an encouragement for Marissa and I and for me personally, Father. Um, I pray, Lord, that you will continue to bless this church for faithful ministry, not only here in Columbia, Maryland, but around the world and the extension of the people that they have poured uh, to either plant churches or disciple in different ways. I think of my, my dear brother, um, Stephen Reisman. And I think of, of, of other dear brothers that are serving in other places, Father. Um, and Lord God, uh, you deserve all honor and glory, as we sang earlier today. Uh, and Father, um, help us, Lord. I pray that you give us courage for those of us that right now know and you put in our hearts people that we need to go and talk to, that we need to pray for, Lord God, that we'll have the opportunity to share the gospel, Father, with them. Well, Lord, I pray as well for those of us that... Today, perhaps we're like leaking our wounds in which we've been hurt, Lord, as we've been trying to be faithful, Lord, that, that your comforting presence will be what we look to right now, Father God. And once again, Lord God, to you the honor and the glory. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.